grace and peace in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And good morning. morning. Welcome uh, to worship on this chilly winter morning. Um, Whether uh, here in the sanctuary or um, or gathered online, we are are called and gathered together by the Spirit uh, as one people, worshiping and responding uh, to the Lord, to the good news of Jesus Christ. If this is your first time with us, uh, my name is Kevin White. I am the the pastor here of of Calvin Presbyterian Church, and on behalf of the whole congregation, welcome. Uh, We are so glad that you are are joining us and tuning in um, to to worship with us uh, and for us to worship with you. Um, Please let us know, especially those who are worshiping online. Uh, we would love to, uh, to know that, uh, that you joined us this morning, so um, leave us a note, send us an email, a uh, note on, comment on Facebook, something, just let us know uh, that, uh, that we were all worshiping together this morning. Um, one note, uh, as, we, uh, as we begin, um, all of the hymns that we are singing this morning uh, are from the, uh, the newer uh, Presbyterian hymnal uh, called Glory to God, uh, not the ones that are in, in the pews. Um, so th- they're not in the, the hymn books in the, in the pews. Uh, so we have these yellow um, packets uh, that have the, the hymns in them. If, uh, if you didn't pick one up when you came in this morning, just, just raise, you, raise your hand uh, and we'll be sure to, to get you one. Uh, those who are um, worshiping online, uh, like, as always, the words will be uh, on, your, on your screen uh, there, so you can join in singing as well. Uh, so that being said, uh, let us join uh, together uh, in prayer as we, as we begin this morning. Lord, we gather for worship, to worship you. As we do so, may your joy be our strength and salvation as we gather to offer you praise in the sounds of our singing, in the spirit of our prayers, and in the meditations of our hearts. May we learn to walk in your light, Lord. Amen. This morning, Linda Tent is assisting in in worship. Linda is one of our deacons, uh, and she will begin by leading us in our call to worship. Good morning. Please join us in our call to worship, which is from Psalm 19, verses 1 through 4, responding with the bold print in your bulletin or on your screen. The heavens are telling the glory of the Lord. The firmament proclaims God's handiwork. Day to day pours forth speech, and night to night declares knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words. Their voice is not heard yet. Their voice goes throughout all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. Our opening hymn this morning is Open Your, Eye, Open Your Ears, O Faithful People. All right. So before we sing this hymn, I'm going to make it a point for 2022 to teach some new music. So I'm taking a minute out of the service, and you're all going to sing this wonderful song. So I'm going to do it part by part. It's really simple. So listen to the first part. Right? Now I'll sing it to you first, and then you're going to sing it back to me. Open your ears, O faithful people, open your ears and hear God's word. Open your hearts, O royal priesthood, God has come to you. Now let's all try it together. Ready? Open your ears, O faithful people, open your ears and hear God's word. Open your hearts, O royal priesthood, God has come to you. Good. Hey, I could actually hear you guys. That's good. That's good. Now, here, listen to the second part. I'll play it first. Now, just 
this happens twice. I'll sing it this time to you. God has spoken to the people, alleluia. God has spoken words of wisdom, alleluia. Try it. I believe it happens twice. Let's try it together. Ready? And God has spoken words of the people, alleluia. That's it. God has spoken words of wisdom, alleluia. Keep going. God has spoken to the people, alleluia. God has spoken words of wisdom, alleluia. And then I just start number two. They who have ears to hear the message. Right? That's all. There you go. That's what I like. Good, but now we're gonna make it seem like we're going we're gonna pick up that tempo just a little bit, because I don't want it to seem like we're trudging through mud, because we're not. So right from the top, let me do a little intro. Ready? One, two, and begin. Here we go. Open your ears, oh faithful people. Open your ears and hear God's word. Open your hearts, oh royal priesthood. God has come to you. God has spoken to the people. Hallelujah. Let's hear it, folks. You got it. God has spoken words of wisdom. <laughs> okay, well, I wanted to dress for the occasion. Yeah. <laughs> okay, our prayer for confession um, this morning. In his account of the beginning of Jesus' ministry, Luke writes, Jesus unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. This is the mission of Jesus, but we are sometimes slow to follow him in his mission. Please join me in our corporate prayer of confession, which is printed in your bulletin and on the screen. This will be followed by a moment of personal or silent confession. Let us pray. Lord, we do not always concern ourselves with your mission in the world. Instead of good news to the poor, we have been about our own advice. Instead of release to the captives, judgment, instead of sight, clouded priorities. Instead of freedom for the oppressed, we offer the status quo. Instead of proclaiming the year of the fear, we proclaim our own favoritism. Forgive us, Lord, in the strength of your grace, be for us what we cannot be for ourselves, that we may be free to truly follow you.
In the name of Christ we pray. Amen. Luke continues, Then Jesus began to say to them, Today the scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Christ has fulfilled the law on our behalf. We are therefore free to boldly follow in the way of Jesus. Hear and believe the good news that in Jesus Christ we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. This indeed is the good news of Jesus Christ, uh, that in him we have peace with God and peace with one another. May the peace of Christ be with you. I invite you now to take a moment, uh, turn um, in, your, in your pews, those who are here, turn uh, and greet one another with the, the peace of Christ. Those who are worshiping at home, um, greet those in your household with the peace of Christ, share the peace of Christ with one another, uh, perhaps reach out through uh, text messaging or even right here on Facebook. Uh, but in whatever ways we are able, let us always continue to share the peace of Christ with one another. In his account of the beginning of Jesus' ministry, Luke writes, Jesus unrolled... We already did that. I did? Yeah. Oh, yes. <laughs> I read that. Sorry. I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah. Let us pray. Speak to us, Lord, for your servants are listening. Your word is full of power and glory. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon us so that we may receive your grace and live as your beloved children. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, amen. Our scripture this morning is from the Apostle Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, continuing from last week with chapter 12, verses 12 through 31. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, through many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in the one spirit we are all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and we all made to drink of one spirit. Indeed, the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot would say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less part of the body. And if the ear would say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less part of the body. If the whole body were hearing, where would the sense of smell be? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them, as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many members and yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need for you, nor again, the head to the feet, I have no need for you. On the contrary, the members of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And those members of the body that we think less honorable, we clothe with greater honor. And our less respectable members are treated with greater respect, whereas our more respectable members do not need this. But God has so arranged the body, giving the greater honor to the inferior member, that there may, 
be no dissension within the body, but the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together with it. If one member is honored, all rejoice together with it. Now, you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. And God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then deeds of power, then gifts of healing, forms of assistance, forms of leadership, various kinds of tongues. All are, are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all possess gifts of healing? Do all speak in tongues? Do all interpret? But strive for the greater gifts, and I will show you a still more excellent way. Beloved of God, the grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. Thanks be to God. You were going to make us say a prayer of confession again for a second. <laughs> no. Well, we need it. We I, I know, maybe. <laughs> There's probably some wisdom in that. Um, yeah. So, uh, first of all, um, I apologize in advance. Um, I re- rewrote this sermon a, a number of times this week, and um, I think I am still kind of working on it. Uh, so, we'll see. Uh, as... As many of you know, uh, I love playing soccer, uh, at least when, when my knee allowed it, uh, which has been interesting for me to think about in light of Paul's image of the body working and, uh, together here. Um, the first time I can recall uh, hearing anything from this passage that, that Linda just read to us and read for us, uh, I was not in church. I was a middle school boy with a group of middle school boys on a soccer field. It was soccer practice. And our coach, Coach Wayne Wyrick, had gathered us together, and he began reading this passage to us. And I still have this very vivid image in my mind and and the sound in my ears. I can see him there on the soccer field opening up his Bible, and I can hear his voice reading to us. If the foot should say, because I'm not a hand... I do not belong to the body. That would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the eye cannot cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, and so on. You see, we had apparently played just an abysmal, disjointed game of soccer that previous Saturday. And Coach Wyrick decided that what we needed as a team What we needed more than passing drills or shooting drills or more running and conditioning was a reminder about what it means not to be a good soccer player, but to be a good team. The importance of recognizing that we are all part of this one team tasked with working together for a common goal. And that that means that that different people were going to have different roles. You can't all try to be, be forwards and run up up the field trying to score a goal because then there's no one left to defend and you can't all sit back and defend because then there's no one trying to score. Apparently, we were playing what we know of as herd ball, all following the ball there, right? And being on a team means that you have a coach. And the coach's job is to organize you in the way that best suits the goals of the team with everyone's different different skills and talents coming together. And our job was to trust that the coach knows what they're doing. And so Coach Wyrick read to us this passage about the church from 1 Corinthians. Now we began uh, our, our time in 1 Corinthians last week, and we built some context. The church that Paul was writing to, the church in, that church, ancient church in Corinth was, in many ways, uh, it was a very dysfunctional church. It was a church in disarray. There were cliques and schisms. There were cases of deep immorality. 
There was divisive arrogance and posturing and one-upmanship and, and demeaning and disregarding those who didn't seem to, to measure up or, or seem as important. There was bad theology running around. Uh, all of these things were going on in, in this Corinthian community. Um, so really, Coach Wyrick was probably onto something because that's not uh, really a bad description of middle school either, if my memory serves. So let me just say also as, a, as an aside here before we get more into the, the passage, I love the fact uh, that there are all these troubles in these early churches. I love it. I find it incredibly hopeful because there is nothing that we deal with in the church today that has not happened before. And, and often has happened far worse. Even going back to these early New Testament churches. Now, the surface problems and the, the symptoms, the way it comes out, that may change and be a little different, different here and there, but the underlying issues are never going to be anything new. And so I think that's worth remembering and noting that through here, we get see an instance here in, in this passage, in this section of 1 Corinthians, and in the letter as a whole, that, that through the inspiration of the Spirit, Paul offers deep theological insight. He offers correction and instruction. But he never assumes that these churches and those people, and therefore us, we people, are ever beyond the grace of God. That despite any of what was going on in that church, Jesus was still Lord in, Cor in Cor Corinth just as he is still Lord here in the church today. Which is why I suspect that Coach Wyrick knew that if there was hope for this Corinthian church, then there was certainly hope for a middle school soccer team. Last week, Paul uh, touched on the specific issue of, of gifts. Because of the many problems going on in this ancient church, uh, one of them was divisions around what they were seeing as a, as a hierarchy of gifts and therefore a hierarchy of people in the church who was really important and who wasn't so important. In this particular church, it was things like, uh, it, it manifested in things like speaking in tongues and these more ecstatic religious experiences. But of course, in any given church or community, right, it might be other things that are seen to, to elevate some above others. Maybe someone's really good at public speaking and someone's not. Or praying eloquent, eloquently out loud or, or someone has lots of money to give and someone doesn't have as much money to give. Or, or someone has a lot of time to give and someone doesn't have a lot of time. Or whatever it is, right, that we tend to idolize. So anyway, in the, the Corinthian church, the view crept in that, that, these ty that certain types of gifts were better or more spiritual than others. And so if you had those gifts, that meant you were better you are more spiritual, you are more important, you are more necessary to the church than others. And last week we saw that, that Paul wants to nip that line of thinking in the, in the bud, and by connect, he connects it back to the, the same old idolatry that they had hopefully been, been converted out of. And then he reminds them, he chastises them, he corrects them, he seeks to, to further and more deeply convert them to the faith that proclaims that actually only Jesus is Lord. And therefore, if that is true, if Jesus is truly Lord, then all have been gifted. Whatever gifts you have have been given by, that one, by the one Lord. You've been graced, right? The church has been graced with varieties of gifts, all of which are manifestations of the one and same Spirit for the common good. And so, Paul's point is clear there. You can't say one is better or more valuable than another because all have been given by the one Lord, the one Spirit. And then that leads him here. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body. And he paints this picture, and we get this picture, right? Using the image of the body to, to talk about things is not unusual. It's not a difficult picture to grasp. Right, using it to talk about a particular organization, a community, a group, a nation, a, a middle school soccer team, even, I bet, Cooper. Where do, how do you get Voltron? How does Voltron form the superhero robot? Do you know? 
I know you know. Lorraine, you know. Where does Voltron, how do you get Voltron? Right, they all work together. Some people, their, their robot lion becomes the leg, and the other robot lion, some of you are wondering what I'm talking about here, but they know. They know the only way you get the superhero Voltron is if the entire team comes together, and somebody in their robot lion forms the right leg, and the left leg, and the body, and the arms, and leg, and all that. That's the only way you get the superhero Voltron, right? This is not a difficult image for any of us to grasp that Paul is talking about. It's a metaphor that even a group of middle school kids at soccer practice can begin to grasp and understand. And it wouldn't have been unusual for these ancient Corinthians to hear this image either, this metaphor. In fact, it would have been quite commonplace. They would hear Paul begin talking about the body and be like, ah, I've heard that before. The ancient Greeks commonly used the image of the body for illustrating um, many things. Among, among them, the way that societies uh, the way the political th bodies were supposed to work and families and organizations and all those diff different types of, of things and social structures. The body was used to talk about how they should operate. This was a well-used illustration, except for this. The typical Greek thought was that some stations in life were obviously higher and more important and better, more valuable than others. Right? In fact, they put moral weight on that, right? A higher station in life meant you were, must be a better and more valuable person. Again, we might say we don't do, nothing's new under the sun, right? We still get sucked into that way of thinking from time to time, right? We would never say it in those exact words, but we, we still fall into that too, right? Think, for example, of how, how we use morally weighted language about Things like economic realities, right? Makers and takers become very morally weighted ways of talking about economic realities. And that slides easily into assumptions about people. So in everyday Greek thought, the, the image of the body was used to reinforce that status quo, that the way it was. Some parts of the body are just more important, so some people were just more important. And some parts we just want to hide and pretend aren't there. But Paul... Notice what Paul does. Paul takes the well-used, well-known metaphor of the body and he subverts it. He flips it upside down from what its normal application was. Coming right off last week's topic of the varieties of gifts, Paul's point here is that if the body is to work as it's supposed to, it's pointless to argue about what parts are more important than others. They're all important. If you want the body to function as it should, they're all important. They're all necessary. They're all valuable. And what matters is not so much who has what particular gifts, but it's the fact that it's the same Lord that has called you all to be a part of this one body. And if anybody is missing from that, the very body of Christ is diminished. And we miss out on the fullness that it could and should be. We miss out on the fullness of the good news of Christ, of what it could and should be to and for and in us. Not just for the world, but also for us. And then even more than that, Paul goes on to say, say to the Corinthians that, that if you really want to start judging the importance of different members, well, if anything, the ones that seem to be weaker and in need of more protection are actually more indispensable. And that like with parts of the body, those we tend to think of as less honorable, less respectable, well, those are the parts we end up clothing with greater honor and treating with even more respect. And so Paul is saying, if you, want to, if you want to play that game, if there's going to be a discussion about what parts may be more important or more indis indispensable, and in this image that means who is more important and more indispensable, if you want to play that game, Paul says, well, they're not going to be the ones that you are likely to suspect. It's not going to be the strongest. It's not going to be the most presentable. It's not going to be the most well-respected. Why? Because we're not just talking about any old body here. We're not dealing with any old organization. 
Paul says we're talking about the church as the body of Christ. And that upside down way of, of living and moving and seeing the world is precisely how the kingdom of God works. That is how it is in Jesus Christ. Notice again how Paul begins, for, for just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with, not an institution, so it is with not a well-run and efficient organization, but rather he says, so it is with Christ. Do not let that not shock you. Paul is not just talking about advice on running a, a good and healthy organization or a good community group or a beneficial society or, sorry Coach Wyrick, not just a good soccer team. There's certainly things, practical things to be gleaned here, the wisdom in this to be, to be pulled and applied all over the place, but that is not the, Paul's primary message. That is not the primary proclamation that Paul is up to. Because the gospel is not helpful advice. It's not even good advice. It's good news. But it's good news that comes with a cost. Hear what Paul is proclaiming to these ancient Corinthian Christians. The body that you are individually and together a part of is nothing less than the body of Jesus Christ in the world. That together we have been incorporated into the very life, not of an organization, but into the very life. And if into the very life, then also into the very death. And if into the very death, death then also into the very raised and resurrected life of Jesus Christ. That's a little bit of a teaser for a few weeks from now when we get to chapter 15. Not just a metaphor or an analogy, but also the very, Paul's talking about the very incorporation and participation in the very person of Jesus Christ in the world. That is what is at stake here for Paul when he's writing this letter to this ancient Corinthian church. Because Paul says, if that is true, if that is what we're talking about, then divisions and schisms, demeaning or disregarding, ignoring or silencing any who are likewise called into the very body of Christ is not just inefficient organizational policy. Paul says it is a denial of the very good news of the gospel. And you know, it's, and it strikes me that we as Calvin Presbyterian Church are nowhere near in as bad a shape as this poor, struggling, conflicted, divisive, quarreling Corinthian church. We're not. We, we get along pretty well. But here's the thing. I'm not sure that's always a good thing. Because we are also far less diverse than this ancient Christian community in that city of Corinth. Now we, we are, as again, as Calvin Presbyterian Church, we are one little part of the fullness of the body of Christ in the world. We are just one part of the Christian expression and proclamation of the good news in, in the world. We are connected. That's part of why we are intentionally in our denomination connected to other churches through our presbytery. We're connected in our a broader denomination to other churches in the Reformed branch of the Christian church around the world. And we are by our confession of faith that Jesus is risen and Jesus is Lord and that we worship the triune God, Father, Son, and Spirit. We are connected and united to the full expression of the body of Christ in the world with all its manifold witness in and through and out of the myriad of ways that the gospel is proclaimed and lived out in the world. We're a part of that. So first, we dare not forget that is what we are a part of. Right now, in this moment, that is what we are a part of. And that is such a good thing. 
And it is a necessary thing for us. But it is also true that, that here, we are pretty monolithic. We're very similar to each other. This ancient Corinthian church, they were diverse. There was deep economic diversity. It was made up of, of really rich and really poor together. There was social diversity. There were slaves and servants and lords and masters together. There was racial and religious and cultural diversity, Jews and Gentiles together, with all the, the varied religious experiences and expectations and, and all the cultural and worldview assumptions that, that that brought out, with all the tension of the, the histories of how different groups had treated each other. That's what was all coming together in this church. Biological, social, and cultural diversity, men and women together in this church. And we have that. That doesn't sound strange, but that kind of diversity with all those things was just not done in ancient Greek culture. It just wasn't done. And so this new thing called the church was unique because, in part because it brought together a much wider and fuller expression of humanity that you would find anywhere else. So that if we believe what Paul says here, it did so so that it could more fully, more deeply, more truly be the very expression of Christ in the world. And so with all of that, it should not be surprising that that experiment was bound to lead to what the Corinthians were experiencing. It was bound to lead to conflict. It was bound to be hard to pull off. So no wonder we read this and we go, this is a church that is struggling. No wonder. But that also means that this is also a church with a deep and profound opportunity to witness to and to experience Christ. To witness to and to experience themselves the good news in a deeper and fuller and truer way because of it. By being a picture, by being an image, an embodied proclamation of the very gospel of Jesus Christ. The very peace, the very shalom of God. The peace that we proclaim that Christ has brought that has been made flesh in the very person of Jesus to heal what has been broken and divided by sin, ours and that of the world. And now Paul says that we who proclaim that are called and invited to embody it to the world and to each other. And so he says, you, plural, together, are the body of Christ and individually members of it. Who you individually are, what you bring, is vital to this full expression of Christ in the world through the body of Christ. And that also means that also that, that who, whoever others as themselves are, is also just as vital to the same together embodiment of this good news of Jesus Christ. And then in fact, that's how you, we actually learn to live it out and to be transformed by it. And so a vital question for us always is who is here? What gifts do we have? We talked about this some last week that sometimes go unnoticed. What gifts do we have to be invited in or to be sent out. But also the question is, who is not here? What part of the body of Christ are we lacking when we gather here? Because the more that we lack those things, the more we are impoverished. Not just in our proclamation of the gospel, but, but also in our understanding, in our being able to receive and to receive the gospel and to be changed, to be transformed, to be converted more fully by the fullness of this good news. And the trouble for us is we live in a deeply fragmented and segregated society. We do. 
We live in neighborhoods with pretty much people very much like ourselves. We go to school with people very much like ourselves. We live and move and work and play in communities and places, most of us with people very much like ourselves. We watch our favorite cable news channels because they're very much like whatever we are. We choose the news we receive and the lens we see through the world, right? Whether through flipping through to our favorite channel or allowing it through a social media algorithm. The lens by and for people very much like ourselves. And there's all sorts of reasons why. Some, um, some are in, but also lots are out of our control. It's a fact of the world we've inherited and we live in. But that just makes the task of the church all that much more important. Our presbytery, for example, has taken up the task, the calling of, of exploring and examining this as it, as it pertains to race. That's a, an area that the presbytery says this is important for this reason. And I, I've been uh, blessed and challenged to be a part of it. I'm on one of the, one of the, the, the task forces. And when the, reason, the reality is Sundays at 10.30 or 11 is still the most segregated hour of the week. All right, look around. We've inherited the weight of that history. Right? That history of the sin of racism. We've kind of inherited it. None of us here chose it. But it's here. It's the result. It's part of our history and part of why things are the way they are. It's important. Our presbytery is discovering. To recognize that our black and brown sisters and brothers in Christ see the world we live in in a very different way than those of us like me that are, are white, than the way I do. And the question Paul asks is then what are we going to do about it if we really want to embody and experience the fullness of Christ? And the same can be said for, for any number of things, right? Economic diversity or, or general cultural diversity, which even includes things like what generation gaps, right? Ezra lives and moves in a world that is very different from the one that I was formed and shaped by. He sees things differently because of it. And so this is a challenging passage. But I can't help also wondering if we are not in the perfect moment, the perfect time, with all the division and divisiveness we see in the world, if it might just be that the time is ripe for us as part of the church to proclaim the gospel to ourselves, that we might be converted and transformed more and more to it, and proclaim it to the world, by more deeply discovering what it truly means to look like the body of Christ. That what we and the world need might just need more than anything might not be a well-run church organization or institution. But it might just be churches exploring how to, how to more fully embody the fullness of the body of Christ. That when our sisters and brothers of color talk about their experiences of racism and injustice and, and the pain, that we respond, as Paul says here, as a body that is also therefore in pain because of it. Or that our interactions with, with people of different economic realities, right? That what's our posture when we are engaging in that? Is it pretty much only in the context of we're the ones going to minister? Or are there ways to be explored that would more fully live into Paul's, and not the ancient Greeks, but Paul's image of the body? There's a whole lot that this passage invites us to think about and to explore. And the more I wrestled with it this past week or so, the more convicted I became of how I do not do this well. Hence the multiple rewrites and even right now. And the reality is no church, small c, is ever going to fully embody the full body of Christ. It's not going to happen. 
and even altogether Big C Capital Church, not before Jesus comes, while we're still on this side of new heaven and new earth. But the challenge for us is still there. The call is still there. The invitation into the gospel is still there to begin now in the present in the ways that we can, challenging no matter how hard or difficult they seem, but to become and to proclaim what we will yet be together in Christ. Maybe it's by things we do here in this congregation. Maybe it's by genuine uh, exploring partnerships that we're going to intentional about foraging. Maybe it's any number of things, but I invite us this year I think the time is ripe in the world to hear what Paul says about the body of Christ and to maybe be willing to ask ourselves some tough questions and to explore some difficult opportunities that might arise. Difficult, but good. So that we might even more than we already do. Because we do. But that we might dive deeper and more fuller into what we already do, embodying the very good news of Jesus Christ. Who is our peace? Our peace with God, yes, absolutely. But also our peace with one another. And all the one another's that we encounter in the world. Not a cheap peace. It's a costly one. but a good peace. And stay tuned. For even in this, we might yet still see, we might yet still see in this, as Paul says, a, st- a more excellent way, a more excellent way forward to be who we are called to be, to embody what we are called to embody. In Jesus Christ. May it be so. Sisters and brothers, may it be so. Amen. Please turn to Spirit, open my heart. I'm going to play through this melody for you. It's actually pretty simple. verse and the refrain are very similar. Spirit, open my heart to the joy and pain of living As you love, may I love in receiving and in giving. Spirit, open my heart. God, replace my stony heart with a heart that's kind and tender. All my coldness and fear To your grace I now surrender Spirit, open my heart To the joy and pain of living As you love, may I love In receiving and in giving Spirit, open my heart. Write your love upon my heart as my law, my goal, my story. In each thought, word, and deed, may my living bring you glory. 
Spirit, open my heart to the joy and pain of living. As you love, may I love in receiving and in giving. Spirit, open my heart. May I weep with those who weep. Share the joy of sister, brother, in the welcome of Christ. May we welcome one another. Spirit, open my heart to the joy and pain of living as you love may i love in receiving and in giving spirit open my heart in saying uh, what we believe uh, we have been and are uh, continuing to use uh, through this little season here um, as our affirmation of faith. Um, we are using a, uh, a confession of faith called a brief statement of faith. Uh, it is one of the uh, more recent um, confessions of faith in our uh, book of confessions as, uh, as Presbyterians. Uh, and uh, the whole con uh, confession of faith came about actually when the, uh, the Presbyterian Church split in the 1800s over uh, north and south over slavery and did not reunite till 1983. Um, and this is a confession uh, that came about an affirmation of faith uh, in that reunification. So it speaks to a lot of those themes. Um, and so we are using a, a portion of it, um, the portion that specifically talks about the work of the Holy Spirit in the church. Um, uh, for these, uh, these weeks here. So I invite you, uh, it is printed in your bulletin, it will be on your screen for those worshiping at home. Um, I invite us to say uh, what we believe uh, using this confession of faith. In life and in death we belong to God. Through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit, we trust in the one triune God, the Holy One of Israel, whom alone we worship and serve. We trust in God, the Holy Spirit, everywhere the giver and renewer of life. The Spirit justifies us by grace through faith, sets us free to accept ourselves and to love God and neighbor, and binds us together with all believers in the one body of Christ, the church. The same Spirit who inspired the prophets and apostles rules our faith and life in Christ through Scripture engages us through the word proclaimed, claims us in the waters of baptism, feeds us with the bread of life and the cup of salvation, and calls women and men to all ministries of the church. In a broken and fearful world, the Spirit gives us courage to pray without ceasing, to witness among all peoples to Christ as Lord and Savior, to unmask idolatries in church and culture, to hear the voices of peoples long silenced, and to work with others for justice, freedom, and peace. In gratitude to God, empowered by the Spirit, we strive to serve Christ in our daily tasks and to live holy and joyful lives, even as we watch for God's new heaven and new earth, praying, Come, Lord Jesus. With believers in every time and place, we rejoice that nothing in life or in death can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. Amen. First Corinthians 8, verses 4 through 6, reminds us, Yet for us there is one God, the Father, from whom are all things and for whom we exist, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom all things and through whom we exist. As such a people belonging to God, 
let us consider what we have received, our time and our abilities, our resources, and how we may give them back to the Lord in love and service to others. If giving to the ministry of this church is a way for you to do that, those worshiping in the sanctuary can place their offering in the offering plate at the back of the sanctuary as you leave after the service. And those worshiping at home can use the online giving option on our website, or you may mail your offering into the church office. Let us give as those who live for God and who live through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him all creatures here below. Praise him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. But we're going to sing that again because I know I barely heard anyone. Again, praise God from who all. I was all set to pray. You threw off my right, timing. I, like, I just no, found myself standing yet. here. <laughs> Let us pray. We praise and thank you, Lord God, for the majesty of your work, and the wisdom of your word, and the generosity of your grace. Let the gifts of our lives bear witness to your goodness and mercy, your faithfulness and justice, and your steadfast love for all. Amen. Found myself standing right next to a microphone when singing was happening, and that's never, a, never a good thing. We are going to uh, to pray here in uh, just a, just a moment, but before we do that, uh, I want to draw your attention to some of the announcements. Uh, those uh, here in the sanctuary, there's a, a full uh, insert of the weekly announcements. Those worshiping at home, you can find uh, find those same announcements on our uh, on our website. Uh, there's a little link for weekly announcements. Um, but uh, highlighting a few, uh, reminder that next Sunday is our annual congregational meeting. Uh, that's January 30th, next Sunday. Uh, it will be following the worship service. Um, it'll be a hybrid uh, meeting, so in person, and we will send out a Zoom link for those um, who are not able to, to, to be here in person for whatever reason. Um, uh, that you can join in through, uh, through Zoom. So we'll be sending that, that Zoom link out. Uh, the purpose of this meeting is to receive the 2022 budget um, that was uh, approved this month um, by a session, uh, to receive the 2021 annual reports, uh, to vote on my terms of call as your pastor, and uh, we have a um, little bylaw change to, to vote on as well, cleaning up some stuff, some language there. Uh, so please um, put, your, put that on your calendar. Um, also, uh, again, help wanted, um, looking for some help uh, during the week, setting up the slides that go up on the live stream so that uh, those worshiping at home have the words of the prayers and the songs and, and stuff like that. So it's creating those and getting those set up uh, during the week um, uh, leading into to each, each Sunday. If you're um, interested in helping out, Willing to help out, uh, please let me know. I'm hoping to get a team of people so that it doesn't fall to one person every week. Um, uh, but uh, yeah, so let me know um, if you're interested in, in that. Uh, finally, our next uh, Calvin meetup is this Friday, January 28th. It is a, an indoor socially distanced picnic. Um, again, this Friday in the Fellowship Hall, I believe the announcement says 12.30 p.m. to question mark, question mark, question mark. Uh, if I recall high school correctly, when you saw question mark, question mark as the ending of any sort of party, you knew it was going to be a good party. So it should be a good time on Friday. Um, bring your own lunch and, uh, and um, no RSVP needed, but uh, mark your calendars uh, for that. Um, but now it is time for us uh, to pray together uh, as God's people. And as we do so, are there any uh, prayer requests, any joys, any concerns to be shared? Roberta. Oh, 
Oh, that's good to hear. Um, yeah, and we will continue. That's your sister-in-law, correct? Um, she at home and recovering, and we will continue. We celebrate, and we'll continue to pray for um, continued recovery there. Um, Betty. For your friend, friend Judy getting results from a biopsy. So yes, we will continue to pray for her and your friend Maria as well. Um, Crystal. That's Mason, Cooper's friend Mason. Yes, we will pray for Mason. Thank you, Cooper. You're a good friend. Um, I do have a, a prayer request and a bit of, of sad news um, that uh, Lois Bell Crankshaw passed away on Friday evening. She hadn't been doing well, as many of you know, um, and she, she passed away on fri Friday evening. So please uh, certainly keep Lynn, Corellis, um, and the whole family. Um, and I know many here are longtime friends of Lois Bell, and um, so we keep all friends and family of, of Lois Bell in our, in our prayers. Um, service times are still being worked out. We'll send out information uh, when we have that. Um, are there any others? Uh, this week we celebrated the life of a dear friend of ours, John Finn. Um, he passed away before Christmas. So I just ask that you keep our husband Emerson in your prayers. Uh, he has early dementia and we don't know okay. what's going to happen with him right now. So just help us figure out that situation. And his wife was, was it Pat? Pat. Pat. Passed away around Christmas time. Okay, yeah, we'll keep um, her husband Emerson and you all, you know, the Pandolfis, and all family and friends in, in our prayers. Yeah. Any others? Okay, let's um, let's go to the Lord in prayer. As we join our hearts and minds. Together in prayer, we call on your name, O Lord. And you would hear us as we say, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for the church. Teach us to be one body in Christ our Lord, with all the members working together and striving for the greater gift of love. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for the world. Lord, bring good news, release, and freedom to the poor, the captives, and the oppressed. Give new hope and vision to all. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And we pray for this community. Lord, lead us by the wisdom of your word to, to go forth in, in mission and service to our neighbors that the hungry and hungering may be filled with the bread from your fields and the bread from heaven. And that in so doing, we too may find nourishment for our souls. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for loved ones. Lord, give us gifts of healing and compassion to those who are hurting. And honor to those who suffer shame. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we continue to pray for those in our church community, especially this morning. We pray for Lynn and the Corrales family and all the friends and family of Lois Bell Crankshaw mourning her death. Give comfort, Lord, and faith to trust that neither life nor death can separate us from your love and others in our church family, Elaine and Barbara, Greg and Lydia, Miriam, Dot, Jared, especially as he begins radiation treatment this week, and Val, and Linda, Judy and John, and Cindy, and families and friends of our church community, Jennifer's father, Debbie's brother-in-law, Betty's friends Maria, and especially today, Lord, her friend Judy, Cynthia's mother, 
Pam's daughter and son-in-law, Roberta's sister-in-law, Kim, Cooper's friend, Mason, the Pandolfi's friend, Emerson, and all who are mourning the death of Pat. We continue to pray for DA's great-niece, Nora, And our world, Lord, and the continued relief efforts in Tonga after the tsunami and the the continuing pandemic, it seems like each week there is just more piled on. Lord, we pray for the hungry and hungering, the poor and poor in spirit, the refugees and the wandering, the grieving, the victims of violence or injustice of any kind. Lord, in all this, we pray for the healing and righteousness of your kingdom, Lord, even here and even now. Hear us in this moment of silence as we lift up to you all the prayers that rest on and rest in and weigh on our hearts. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. May the poor receive good news, captives released, recovery of sight to the blind, the oppressed freed, and the year of the Lord's favor proclaimed through the fullness of your people, so strengthened that we may live in the world as those you have chosen and called out. May our lives reflect our prayers through Jesus Christ our Lord through whom with boldness we join our voices as we join our hearts as one body, praying together, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our closing hymn uh, is the last song in the packet, um, We Are One in the Spirit. That should sound familiar, right? We are one in the Spirit, we are one in the Lord, and we pray that all unity may one day be restored, and they'll know we are Christians by our love, by our love, yes, they'll know we are Christians by our love. We will walk with each other, we will walk hand in hand, We will walk with each other, we will walk hand in hand, and together we'll spread the news that God is in our land. And they'll know we are Christians by our love, by our love. Yes, they'll know we are Christians by our love. We will work with each other, we will work side by side we will work with each other we will work side by side and we'll guard human dignity and save human pride and they'll know we are christians by our love by our love yes they'll know we are christians by our love all praise to the father from whom all things come And all praise to Christ Jesus, God's only Son. And all praise to the Spirit who makes us one. And they'll know we are Christians by our love, by our love. Yes, they'll know we are Christians by our love. Beloved of God, you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. Therefore, clothe with honor those you think less honorable. Proclaim indispensable those that seem weaker. 
and treat with greater respect those thought of as less respectable. Remembering that if one suffers, all suffer. But if one is honored, all rejoice. For in the one Spirit, we were all baptized into one body. The love of God the Father, the grace of His Son Jesus, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. Amen.